plastic. I don't know. It must be an old joke. Agnostics claim that they do not know whether or not God exists. Theists surmise they're reprobates. Atheists suppose they're cowards. Agnostics are often labeled weak, wishy-washy, lax, lazy, passive, apathetic, even pathetic. I could find myself an agnostic. I wouldn't want to be labeled any of those. Are there different kinds of agnostics? How do they each think? Can agnosticism deepen appreciation for existence? Why argue for agnosticism? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. If I were to be an agnostic, I would like to be so with sword and flame. That's why I begin in London with a philosopher who calls himself a passionate agnostic. Mark Vernon is a former Anglican priest who rejected theism and became an atheist, and then rejected atheism and became an agnostic. Finally finding, he says, rich comfort. I'll hear his story. I was a priest in the Church of England, oh. um, and I was ordained, and I did a first job at curacy uh, for about three years. Um, but during that process, I became disillusioned with the church, uh, partly because of the current debates that are going on in the church. Um, being a liberal, I found the conservative rise uh, uncomfortable. But at the same time, I started to read humanistic philosophers, and I became very suspicious of the power games that are played in theology. So I left, and I left an atheist, and I felt like I was breathing the fresh air of rationalism. It didn't feel like I was losing my faith. It felt like a very positive step forward. Then, uh, a few years on, uh, I started to become disillusioned with that as well. And I sensed that there's a kind of puritanism involved in atheism um, that wants to clear itself of anything that smacks of religion. And that seemed to me to involve denying certain parts of life as well, the human condition, which I think is to be limited. And I found I was becoming an agnostic. I read an essay by T.H. Huxley who was the person that invented the word agnostic. Um, and he invented the word as a rebuke, both to those religious people who claim to know things that actually are only their opinions, but also to the scientists of his day who claim to know things but are actually only their best guess. And so I embraced this agnosticism. And like Huxley and others around him, I didn't just feel this was a kind of shrug of the shoulders position as if nothing more could be said. It actually matters. The reason why it matters is that the agnostic spirit, I think, is both inherent in good religion and in good science. But today, because of extremism of various sorts, religion and scientific, it tends to be squeezed out. Think of the religion first. It seems to me to be part of the religious quest that the closer you get to God, the closer you get to something that's beyond comprehension, that's unknown. Similarly, in science, I think that the most attractive kind of science is the science that, sure, explains an awful lot and answers an awful lot of questions, but at the same time throws you onto deeper and deeper questions about life. The cosmologists are the people that can explain an awful lot about the universe, amazing amount about the universe, but at the same time raise these bigger questions, such as why we're here at all, why there's something and not nothing. I think I'm a passionate agnostic because uh, it matters both philosophically, you might say, but also politically. If you think about science, science can heal us, but it can't make us whole. Um, it can entertain us, but it can't make us happy. So we need to have an understanding of science that understands its limits. And I think that's where the agnostic spirit in science becomes so important. Um, similarly, in religion, you only have to say the word fundamentalist to realise that religion, when it thinks that it knows it all, and in particular when it thinks it knows it all about God, becomes very dangerous. So it matters both for religion and for science, this agnostic spirit, I think. Well, what you're saying and what excites me about your agnosticism is it's not a barrier to prevent further exploration, but it's energy on both sides. If you start a new synagogue, temple or church uh, or mosque uh, of passionate agnosticism, I may be your first member. I'd be delighted to have you along if such a thing were going to happen. Um, I've been a priest once and I don't really want to return to it again. Passionate agnosticism. I do like that. 
appreciating both science and religion, goading them too. Coming from the high church marks a religious agnostic. Fine for him, not for me. If I'm to consider agnosticism, I need to speak with diverse agnostics, discern their reasons, dissect their arguments. I'd like an agnostic unfettered by religious rituals and unaffiliated with religious organizations. I'd like an analytic agnostic. I needn't go far. An hour's drive from London to Oxford, where I meet the director of the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University, Nick Bostrom. Nick's a pioneer in transhumanism, what our species may become. Existential risk, the threats to our survival, and the nature of the universe. Why is he agnostic? Nick, I'd be really interested in how you reflect on the ultimate questions of reality, theistic, atheistic. What are your views? Well, I guess the first step would be to specify more precisely what you would mean by these possibilities. So, say, the theistic possibility. What exactly would you include in that? You would say that there is a, an ultimate creator God who is infinite in all of his mm -hmm. primary virtues, incorporeal, so no body. Mm -hmm. And that is the terminus of explanation. So rather than an, an infinite regress of causation, that entity is the mm. terminus of explanation. That is the God hypothesis. So there are lots of smart people who believe that. Yes, a lot yeah, of smart people who don't. Exactly. So, <laughs> it's one of those situations where um, you could pick sides, but how do you know you don't pick the wrong side? Like, why would you be more likely to be right than all these other clever people who have thought about it for a long time? Now, normally when you have a situation like that, you should acknowledge that you don't really know where the answer lies. Well, it seems to me that similar thing should be done in this situation, that if you have experts on either side who have opposing views, and if the evidence seems insufficient to settle the question, you should be agnostic. Uh, you should maybe try to assign probabilities to it, but not 100% to one and zero to the other. There are two levels of reasoning you can apply to this. So, on the one hand, you can study the specific arguments, the pieces of evidence, uh, one by one, and learn all the details. And so you would think about the theodicy problem, like the problem of evil. Uh, how could a perfectly good, perfectly powerful God create children dying of cancer? And you could think about the arguments theologians have made that try to circumvent yeah. this. Yeah. Um, you could think about the puzzle of the universe looking fine-tuned and how could that have happened by chance? What are the alternative and And so on and so forth. The other level of approaching this is by uh, taking a step back and realizing that there are lots of people who have already thought about these things uh, and the specific arguments, and they have formed some overall assessment on the basis of that. And unless you have some reason to think that you are much more likely to find the truth if you look at all the specific arguments than these other people, then, then maybe you should just uh, look at the distribution of opinion that you find among people who have looked at it and, and try to match that in your own probability estimate. Now, if you do that, there are still complications. Like, you might want to try to take into account biases that you think have affected some people's opinion. You might want to consider whether not just the numbers of people who hold these different opinions, but whether they are independent of each other. So, if the reason why you have a billion people holding one view is that there was one person who decided that this was the view to hold and everybody else has just copied that person, then clearly you don't have a billion independent pieces of evidence, yes, you really yes. just have one. Right. And so, you can, you can begin to think about these things at the meta level in that way. It's very easy to sort of find ways in which the other side is imperfect, but, but you really got to apply the same critical scrutiny to your own side before that sort of reasoning would actually give you evidence that you are right. And it's still not clear exactly what in the end you will believe, but it does seem that if you do accept this indirect approach, it would undermine any very huge confidence you would have either in the uh, atheistic or theistic argument. Nick's a realist, not a radical. He argues from common sense, for and against God. 
assigning each argument reasonable probabilities. He also weighs the opposing opinions of thoughtful people. Nick's how to think guidance is good, but his approach will not appeal to theists or atheists because both are convinced they already know the truth. I should speak with theists and atheists, get their separate takes on agnosticism, treat them equally. I'm looking forward to this. First, a theist. I go from Oxford to Cambridge to meet the director of the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion. He's a molecular biologist, a leader in cancer research, a scientist who believes in both God and evolution, Dennis Alexander. We meet in his lab. Dennis, isn't agnosticism an honest recognition that I really don't know the best solution? Well, I actually think, although intellectually, you know, it sounds as if one can be an agnostic. I think in reality, pragmatically, because we all have to construct our own biographies, we actually are committed to, to certain philosophies, actually, which actually either pragmatically say there is a God or there isn't a God. We have to behave as if we know the answer, well, even if intellectually we say we don't. I don't use the term agnostic in the sense of, well, I don't know, it doesn't matter. I would use it in, in its strongest possible meaning saying, I am deeply concerned, I deeply want to, to investigate both sides and really understand what, what works, not because I want a behavioral mechanism for my life, but I'm really concerned because it's a burning question for me. Spoken, if I might say so, as a truly committed person. <laughs> the difficulty about, let's say, staying in an agnostic position the whole of one's life would be, you know, you've only got one life. Now, if we could re replay the tape of life again, you know, we could have several runs at it and we could try out different views. But as far as we know, we don't have that luxury. So I think that kind of helps one to perhaps become committed maybe to one direction or another. If I really am committed to a, a, a desire to believe in God, I am equally scared and frightened to make the wrong choice, to fool myself into believing in something that really isn't true. Because I, it would almost be to me a, a form of blasphemy to, to force myself to believe in, in a God if, if I really didn't. I think that attitude is exactly right. And I, I think that one should never, ever force oneself into a certain belief, either in science or in the more general decisions of life. And I have to say in my own case, you know, I'm looking for a broader explanation of why something exists. I am too. And I'm sure you are as well. <laughs> but, you know, then obviously it comes down to this finely balanced argument of whether the God hypothesis gives us a better explanation for all that we see around us in the universe and in our daily lives and in our science, uh, or whether it doesn't. It's like we're living in a play. We sometimes feel we're living in a theater. We're living out a drama. Morality has come out of matter. I mean, it's such an amazing thing, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. So what, what, what is the kind of upper level narrative that makes best sense of that? Now, to me, theism, the idea of a personal God who has intentions and purposes in bringing this whole play into being, the great drama of life, that seems to me to make quite reasonable sense as an inference to the best explanation. When you see many of your colleagues that you know personally who affirmatively do not believe in God, and you know they are good people in their personal lives, they are committed scientists, and they really do seek to understand the nature of reality, does that ever give you pause for thought and uh, potential doubt? Potential doubt, of course, yes. I was brought up on a home where belief in God was part of the normal everyday life. So by the time I came into science, uh, I was already a believer in God. And therefore, my faith and my science have grown up together as two very natural domains of my everyday life. And I think many other people have been brought up in a secular home where that wasn't the case. So it's not unexpected that many of my scientific colleagues would have a secular view on life. But that argument all by itself would give me doubt, that would actually move me more intellectually towards an agnosticism because I would doubt my own internal feelings because it may be culturally biased or, or, or 
biased because of my own home life. I, I agree with you absolutely, but I think the great thing is we can look at our intellectual beliefs and we can see if they're well justified or not. Now to me, faith in God is, is a well justified belief. I think that's an incredibly important pilgrimage to be on. I respect Dennis' beliefs, perhaps envy him in his certitude, but I cannot make those beliefs my own. I feel his pressure, the difficulty, as he says, of staying in the agnostic position in the whole of one's life when I've only got one life. I know Dennis is concerned with my welfare, but still, I tense up and slightly withdraw. I go to Stanford to meet one of the originators of string theory, a visionary physicist who describes a vast cosmic landscape of innumerable universes and who proclaims the illusion of intelligent design, Leonard Susskind. Lenny's a tough guy, especially when it comes to God we meet in his home. Leonard, why isn't agnosticism the best philosophical position for everyone to take? Well, <laughs> um, first of all, what does agnosticism mean? I'm fairly sure about some things, less sure about other things. I am fairly sure no supernatural entity will intervene if I step off a cliff I will fall. The laws of gravity will do that to me. I am fairly sure that if my genetic makeup happens to be of a certain kind, no matter how hard I pray, I will get cancer. Right. I am fairly sure that God doesn't intervene to be able to move electrons around in a way that, uh, that uh, does uh, things that uh, we or he or she likes. Uh, there's no evidence for that. All the evidence points in the opposite direction, that the laws of nature go the way they go. If you were to ask me about the very beginnings of the universe, the origins of it, why it is there, does it have a purpose, could an intelligence have been involved in creating it, and so forth, there I would have to say I'm completely agnostic. I'm completely agnostic to the point where I just don't feel that we are anywhere near understanding enough about the world to even address those questions, not only not to answer them, but to even ask them properly to, and to make sense out of the questions. So I would say I'm almost beyond being an agnostic, that to say I'm not sure if there's a God or not a God, I have the feeling that it's the wrong question. Or, or, or that we're not at the point where we can e formulate the, right. the, this kind of question. Right. I always think of it as a kind of curtain. There's the things that are hidden behind the curtain, and there are the things which are exposed in front of the curtain. It's always the tendency to believe that the things which are behind the curtain are controlled by uh, supernatural, and the things which are in front of the curtain that we can see are not controlled by the supernatural. Well, the history of science moves the curtain back. And the history <laughs> of science just keeps moving the curtain back. But it never gets it quite all the way back, and we never really know how far uh, <laughs> the, it has to go. Right. And uh, so that's the situation. We get pushed back to the universe earlier and earlier and earlier, and always that curtain is still there. What's behind the curtain? If I knew what was behind the curtain, I would publish it. <laughs> Some would point to the very comprehensibility of the universe, which didn't have to be as, if not a evidence of a supernatural intelligence, at least consistent with what such a supernatural being would have created. Yeah, it does look like there are patterns in the universe, that the universe respects certain laws, certain principles. First of all, could we live in a universe that had no pattern? What would it mean for it not to have pattern? Just complete randomness? So as you, as you push further and further back, um, what is the end point? Do you see the laws of physics ever be self-explaining? I can't tell. And I think, it's, I think it is a very interesting and big question. Another, another way of asking it is, could the universe have been otherwise? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think we know. I, I have no idea. I think it's way, way beyond what we are presently capable of answering. 
Lenny rejects any personal God, and he is radically agnostic whether there is any overarching intelligence or purpose or meaning in the universe. Asking about God, he suggests, may be asking the wrong question. I still lack coherent thinking about agnosticism, so I go to Berkeley to meet one of my favorite philosophers whose relentless pursuit of truth captivates me, John Searle. Even when I disagree with John, which isn't often, I'm enlightened by the originality of his insights and the precision of his arguments. I'm closer to a balanced agnosticism than I am to absolute certain atheism, but for a purely logical reason, and that is you can't demonstrate a universal negative. That is, I can't demonstrate to you uh, that there aren't invisible uh, animals running around this room, and I can't demonstrate to you that God does not exist. Uh, the point, however, is that it is a very ambitious hypothesis that, that God exists, and there is very little reason to suppose that it's true. What a rational person, I think, has to do is to say, well, uh, there isn't enough evidence uh, to support such an adventurous hypothesis, so we have very serious doubts about it, but that doesn't mean we know that it's false. It's just this insufficient reason to suppose it's true. I can't resist telling you an anecdote. As an undergraduate, I was a member of the Voltaire Society, and we used to have dinner with Bertrand Russell, and he was 85 years old. And we thought, well, you know, he's getting on in years. And we put the question to him. We said, well, suppose it were all true that after you pass away, you show up at the pearly gates, what would you say to him? <laughs> and Russell didn't hesitate a minute. He said, I would say to him, you didn't give us enough evidence. <laughs> and that, I think, is the right answer. If God does exist, which I think is very unlikely, then he is guilty of one thing. We have very inadequate evidence of his existence. Now, maybe he has some deep reason he wants to test us, <laughs> test our faith. But there's something else about this, and that is I'm suspicious of believing something which we desperately want to believe. Mm. And of course, one reason that this is such an important issue is we would all like to believe uh, that there is a meaningful uh, world beyond our own capacity to inject meaning into it. We would like to believe that the people we most love will continue to exist, and it's very hard to be told that all these wonderful people will cease to exist altogether. Furthermore, another feature is we'd like there to be justice in the end. Mm -hmm. Since it's obvious that there's no justice here on earth, we'd very much like there to be a divine justice which will come. I think religion is here to stay because it does satisfy these needs. But intellectually, I don't think you can justify it. The arguments for God's existence are uniformly bad. So when you look at the argument, the only reason you're not an, an absolute atheist is because you can't prove a negative. Mm -hmm. There's no other reason why you would skew towards agnosticism versus atheism. I can imagine experiences that would convince me that God existed. But the experiences that uh, would, would show that God did not exist, they seem to me readily available. But uh, there are intelligent people who believe in the existence of God, and I can only think that they believe it because they think the reality that we know about is not the only reality. And they, they might be right, it's just I don't know of any reason to suppose they are right. A friend of mine seeking truth about God asked me what I believed. He seemed overly credulous, and I worried that he might act on what I said. So here's what I said. I have no confidence in my ability to know truth about God. Zero. Even though I have more confidence in my ability than in anyone else's. I was joking. Well, half joking. Most agnostics are indifferent and unconcerned. They do not know whether God exists, and they do not much care either. I go for the combative, intense kind of agnostics. Pugnacious, persistent, passionate. Argumentative agnostics who probe and push, who resist the false comfort of forced certitude, who challenge conventional wisdom of theists and atheists. 
I do not like compromise on matters of ultimate concern. If agnosticism were merely betwixt theism and atheism, I'd want nothing of it. Here's my credo. Agnosticism, properly pursued, can be enriching and ennobling, engendering awe and humility amidst the great crush of existence. Even without expectation of resolution, and even if atheism were to wind up true, human beings should wonder whether God exists. There's no greater quest that's closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.